Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader, and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. At this point, any company from the smallest mom and pop shop to the biggest multinational conglomerate needs to devise and implement a cybersecurity strategy that protects them the best. But what are the specific needs of the largest companies in the world? Gene Yu has over 25 years of experience in cybersecurity for some of the world's largest brand names, such as Warner Brothers, Sony, Computer Science Corporation, Coca-Cola, Symantec, and more. More recently, he served as Senior Vice President and Head of Information Security for City National Bank. He has provided security for the largest of the large across a range of industries. So if there are specific needs for these megacorps, Gene will know all about them. Uh, we're going to talk today about the specific skills and experiences uh, you need if you want to run in, uh, run security for these types of industry giants. Uh, Gene Yu, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your security journey. This is, you have obviously, you've, you've, you've come quite a way, but how and when did you first get interested in, in tech and computers and security? Wow. <laughs> I mean, that goes all the way back to like 1992 when I started okay. out as a network engineer for uh, IS, uh, Internet Service Provider. It was one of the first Internet Service Provider <clears throat> here in California, but it was specific to providing services for uh, Japanese clientele like mm. Toyota, Honda, and Nissan's because they had a headquarters there. So all these people, uh, when they came to the United States, because of the language barrier and the communication needed, you know, and that's why we actually started a hosting company just in Japanese, even though I can't even read or write Japanese. Okay. So it was an interesting learning experience. Yeah. And uh, 1992, you're, you were very much ahead of the curve in terms of, you know, a lot of corporations probably weren't even thinking about internet until, you know, the mid nineties or late nineties or whatever. So they were, that, was, that seems like that was like right at the right at ground zero there for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Interesting times. Yeah. Uh, well, so tell me a little bit about that. What was uh, what was it like uh, being an internet service provider at a point when uh, they they weren't ubiquitous like that? Well, I think you know I had I think the key thing is always having a good mentor mm. and being curious about what it is. You may not understand it or know what it is, right. but I think just. Uh, the kind of the methodical or mechanical way of what we do uh, in the engineering space is very prevalent. So, hmm. you know, I think it goes without saying having that men mentorship uh, yeah. goes far along than any kind of career path. And I've been very fortunate in having those kind of people around. Um, so were you drawn from early in life to work for a large company specifically, or is that just something that sort of happened through cumulative life experience? Um, I think um, I'm very fortunate. I think, you know, Going, I don't think it's a matter of the size, but you know, I'm very fortunate in the sense that all these large companies, the leaderships or the management took a chance on me. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm very thankful and you know, blessed for all those opportunities. Uh, it's not like I actually tried to go for them. It's okay. just that the, many of those companies were near in Los Angeles, where I'm from. Yep. Yep. So it made it really easy for you know, moving forward. Plus, if you uh, you know the fact that you were you were there since 1992, I imagine there weren't a ton of people who had comparable experience, you know, going that far back, right? Yeah, it was a but you know, it's a. I think you know, if compared to other states, I think LA has a very unique position in a lot of companies, and it just you just kind of like the Hollywood thing, right? You got to know somebody to get in the business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I would definitely want to talk more about that later. But uh, tell me a bit about your learning path. Did you study computer science in school? Were you self-taught? And what are your strategies now for learning new things? So I'm actually self-taught. Okay. Uh, my original st field of studies actually was like architecture, civil engineering, mm. uh, mechanical engineering. But I think it goes without saying the, the mentality of the engineer doesn't really change, yes. you know, even, so for me, um, you know, again, goes back to having the right mentorship uh, and being curious. Uh, and I think it's also type of personality you have in, well, I think it's with any business in being able to uh, adapt. Now, nowadays, um, you know, being in an operator now running a company, it's a different uh, kind of learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, again, it goes back to now I have more, uh, obviously I'm reading, constantly listening to podcasts like yours and just absorbing a lot of information. And, but really for me now is really how do I apply all of this knowledge? And also, again, going back to having the right mentors. Okay. Um, do, was there any sort of crossover specifically between 
you know, sort of being a security architect in terms of designing like a, a security system and being an actual architect? Did you, were there certain like structural issues or things that you could sort of apply one way or the other? Absolutely. You don't yeah. want the building to fall down. Mm -hmm. And it's like everything I always tell people, it's like, you're just, you're, you're building a fence or you're building a wall or you're building a castle. The, right. the, 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 the schematics and how you approach and schematics as to how you execute doesn't really change. Fundamentally, the, the laws of gravity and everything else is really the same. Mm -hmm. um, now only difference is that, you know, I know how to build a castle. I know how to <laughs> right. make sure it's safe, yep. but I have to be able to know what's outside the horizon and having the right watchtower to be able to see what's going on because yeah. that's the reality of what we're dealing with now. Okay. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of guard towers basically. Yeah. 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 Um, so because some of our viewers are just starting in cybersecurity or even just considering jumping in for the first time, could you work, walk me through your day-to-day -day work as a senior level cybersecurity director? Like what types of jobs and responsibilities, uh, you know, are part of your daily work day and, and what time does your day start and do you ever get to clock out? Or are you on call forever? Well, that, <laughs> good Lord, that's a lot. That's a lot of questions all at once. Oh, no, 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 no. These actually, are the ones people want to know. <laughs> well, do, I, do, I ha do I get weekends? <laughs> no, so, so, you know, I get, I guess so many, I get, I guess so many of these questions about yeah. the kind of the profession. And because I spend a lot of time with uh, giving uh, lectures and conversation in schools. So I get that comment. So I actually have a actual same answer, which is, you know, when I was an operator or when I was an engineer, director, manager, it doesn't make a difference. At the end of the day, there's like this 80% of work where you start from nine to five, let's just yep. call it. And then uh, that of that work is really around uh, enabling business, uh, executing projects that enable business or technology improvements or enhancements. And then a lot of administrative stuff like documentation, uh, presentation, and also trying a lot of trying to also making sure you get the budget so you could actually invest in the things that you need. Um, day to day life is really, you know, spending time with your peers, uh, your coworkers, your management to really understand what's going on. But offset of that is either you're building or you're responding or you are strategizing. And that's the way I would kind of commonly tell it. Now, I know a lot of students and um, people who are starting, they say, well, I want to do engineering. I want to do application security. I want to do IT. And I think everybody's capable of doing any kind of job include from the development. The question really is, is you got to enjoy what you're doing because day in, day out, corporate life could be exciting or it could be very benign. And, mm -hmm. you know, you just got to love what you're doing. Do you, is there a, would you say there's sort of a, a one third, one third, one third breakdown of the, the sort of three main pillars you said there of sort of building and I, I wish it was that easy um, yeah. but it changes you know, from day to day yeah and but what I tell people is at the end at the end of the day you know you have to be 80 20 and when I say 80 20 not 80 percent work and 20 percent like thinking I really mean like 80 percent to innovate what you're doing or to really stand out and what I mean by that is if you're not looking at your day-to-day -day operation and you're not automating it you're not making yes. it easier for you then you're just if you're and then you're spending 80 percent of the time you're wasting everybody's time yep so i always tell people like 80 percent, you need to be thinking about how to make your job easier how to make this automated and yep. how to look beyond what your day-to-day -day is and 20 percent is where i expect you to spend like doing the day-to-day -day work and unless we shift that paradigm i think people get just you know every day it's you know email at seven o'clock and then responding to emails writing presentations spreadsheet it's just you got to get out of that mentality and innovate yeah, no, there was, we had a, a cybersecurity analyst on who said basically the way to move up in the ladder on that position is to innovate yourself out of your own job or to uh, exactly. automate yourself out of your job. Yeah, exactly. So uh, um, uh, let's see, moving on to sort of, uh, you know, larger scale things here. I would imagine that for cybersecurity pros who would want to work for major corporations, whether in the entertainment industry or the finance industry, there's got to be a lot of applications. So, you know, as a result, a lot of techniques that HR uses to call candidates for not having, you know, the right skills or experience are probably, you know, happening to them without knowing it. So how does one get on the first rung of the ladder to work at these type of companies? I know you said you were, you were there, you knew some people, you were, you were there from an early point, but what are some common skills or experiences that companies are looking for when considering you for their team? 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna say uh, probably say something that HR is not gonna like, but for every job that I had, I I never asked the HR to do any pre screen. Mm -hmm. I want to see the resume for myself and the yeah, team. Everything. And we, set a, we set aside a time and look for it. Um, it is important because I think oftentimes they, a lot of good candidates get slashed because of some degree or mm -hmm. some experience uh, or their certificates. So I try to remove that barrier and give a lot of people opportunity. Now, separately, I think when uh, professionals are starting, <clears throat> And they, when they put their resume, the most important thing is create your objective, write your objective very clearly and concise. Because we know you may not have experience, but ask for the opportunity, like speak English in a very simple way to say, I want this job and show it. Don't care yeah. about your job description, like what you worked at or what role. But the other aspect is forget about the certificate. I would focus on the type of work that you are doing and don't make it up. Just say, look, you know, I've done this and show a little bit of progression or just say, hey, I worked at McDonald's. It's OK. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I studied all this. Show me those by saying in the resume, hey, like I didn't have a job, but look at all the self-study I done. Okay. To show and prove to us that, hey, you are really interested and serious about it. And also, of course, you know, networking and, you know, handing your resumes out or, you know, yep. getting business card is critical, I think. Are there any red flags that you see on, on resumes that, that make you sort of instinctively breeze past a candidate? No, you know, because unless I, you know, I'll be honest with you. I, I kind of have like this rule. I get a big stack of resume, I print it out and I go through one's view, first view. And those are the kind of the first cut and the red flags that I would normally like would be seeing is like when they have done something in a sequence or a job that looks like, the, the role or the function doesn't make sense to be against their title okay. or they overemphasize something that doesn't like, for example, you know, somebody said I deployed data loss prevention and completed to project execution in two months. I work for semantic. I deployed DOP. There's no way you could do that. Yeah. For, oh, okay. Okay. That, that's like, definitely a red flag. Yeah, yeah. It's like I was involved or I was part of the project, but don't say I ran the project. Like little right. things, little language verbiage like that is where I catch up on things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what was I gonna say? I was, uh, yeah. To to that end, do you do you see a red flag when you see someone with we call it kind of cert collector, where someone is maybe like low in the industry, but they somehow magically have like fourteen, you know, random certifications? Does that does that is that a, a red flag to you, or is it just being oh, hey, no, they like to learn? Not. Absolutely, no? not. For me, yeah. it's like there's two types of people. I mean, two approaches to life: academic versus reality. Yep, and some of these people may not have the experience, but they're well versed and they're te te technically they could yeah. articulate exactly academic, and that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, not a red flag for me. That's a yeah. That's that's sometimes that's the only option if you're in a small town, but you want to move to a big town and exactly keep exactly. keep learning. Um, so you've worked across, you know, and I, I know that maybe this isn't necessarily across the board, but you've worked across a huge range of mega corporations and all sorts of industries. Are there any? Uh, commonalities between them in terms of their cybersecurity needs, like specific issues that they face that are less common amidst smaller companies? No, I think after, you know, 2002, the shift to, you know, information security, the CISO, the cybersecurity, all kind of really kind of, I think even now continues to morph. The mm -hmm. commonality hasn't really changed. The, the lack of budget and investment of organization to, you know, invest on people, process, and technology, or you know, time, resource, and money. Uh, I think still lacks. I mean, you could go across the entire hemisphere, and it'll still be you know two percent. This is the yeah. reality. Uh, and then there's the little snowflakes. Um, but I think, as a um, general rule, for me, whether it's small or big company, it hasn't really changed. There's hmm. still the you know the management layer. There's the business layer, and then there's the IT layer. And I think the key for everybody to understand is to make, make sure that this isn't about like IT. This is about, at the end of the day, like enabling business and protecting mm -hmm. the business. Uh, and if you can't articulate that or see that as a more of a business acumen, then kind of take a step back. But, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a process. So Okay. Um, so jumping back to what you said there about... Um not enough budget and not enough like what would what would you say is a more appropriate 
level of budgeting for these type of issues and what would the extra budget money be spent on? Um, I think the first part is, you know, as much as I'm a vendor, but what I would say is it really investing on the people. And when I say that, get them the appropriate training, get them to their conferences. Yep. Oftentimes, even as a re-security, we go to clients and everybody's been there for like 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they go to one training a year, which is, you know, and it's not fair because if you look at the IT scape, you know, they're constantly going, but security people, uh, you know, we also need to socialize and network to see what's outside the box. And, you know, we kind of need, they need to really look at investing that, but also um, giving people opportunity because we don't have enough security professionals anyways. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you hire somebody with no skills, have a plan of action. What is their professional yep. you know, or career development could look like? Educate and send them the training. Uh, have a plan, of, you know, for how to onboard our, uh, in, uh, staff. Yeah. Have, have, have you had to spend a lot of time thinking about the cybersecurity skills gap, as they call it? Um, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's serious in a, because, you know, when I was in uh, various companies, it took us good three to six months uh, once we post. Uh, and it's really never about how much they want. It's having everybody buy in versus mm -hmm. your gut feeling. And I think the important part is obviously to get everybody's buy-in, but then, you know, I always remind even my old staff when they're hiring is like, well, she doesn't have any experience. I'm like, okay. And like you did when you started. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm very, I wouldn't say I'm very, you know, angry about it, but oftentimes I think everybody's kind of like in their head. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, so. the, res or the job description calls for, 10 years of experience on something that's only five years old or, you know, other unicorn exactly. issues. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> or, you know, you need all of the certs and, and a master's degree just in case. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, looking into your, your personal bio, you worked for uh, Sony in cybersecurity and Sony is obviously famous for the, the hack, you know, via nation state attacker in 2014. And it looks like you were there the two years following. So I'm guessing you were brought in to mitigate the issue. No, you know, it's part of a, you know, I, I I think my, one of my old boss said, it's like, I, I, I get into a job where I can't go wrong because it's already bad. <laughs> yeah, so right, right, take, yeah. Take that for what it's worth, okay? Stop um, digging. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> no, it wasn't, it wasn't a cleanup. It was actually to actually modernize and improve their yeah. program. Great, that's, um, what I was, that's what I was gonna ask. So yeah, tell me a, a little bit about uh, what the sort of like strategy was uh, after, that, after that happened. No, so I think, you know, Sony and just the general, the team, the global team and the, the pictures, you know, these are the set of some, whatever happened before is one set of the conversation. But what was happened after the kind of the, the people getting together, understanding the now the value of security, uh, what they need to do potentially, a lot of this information and the people that was brought in to clean up and then to modernize, you know, uh, you know, it goes without saying, it's probably one of the most like monolithic effort in like putting the best security model you could ever think of mm -hmm. into a company. And it was just amazing to learn and see what they did. Obviously, uh, my role was very specific to improving uh, vulnerability management, application security, secure, um, secure built, you know, security, security hardening and all those things. Right. But, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it was very focused task and, you know, it's, it's what I love doing. So it was a fun time for me. Was it, uh, was the result pretty similar to what you had envisioned? Like, you know, when you're sort of planning, like, I hope we can do this, 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 and this, were all of those uh, things pretty much implemented to your satisfaction? Yeah. Well, not to my satisfaction, to okay. my <laughs> management. Okay. Course. Good. But, um, no, it was, it, you know, like anything else, you know, this is kind of the irony of the problem in industry. It's general for IT and security. They spend money and they expect it to turn and turnkey and everything to work. Mm -hmm. You know, implementation is a, whether it's a technology or process, it, it's a, it's a, it's a very like methodical way you have to do things. Otherwise you brought, bring things in and it doesn't work. And you wonder why it didn't work because your implementation plan was like 30 days. Well, that doesn't work like that. Right. Um, because of my semantic background, you know, implementation, you know, is a very key thing and making sure you understand what the next steps are. 
Um, but for us, uh, when especially when I was at Sony, you know, having and making sure the stakeholders understand exactly what the you know the output is going to be, and mm -hmm. also the most important thing, what is the long-term running model is going to look like because okay. it's not a bolt-on place because you have to be repeatable and it has to be repeatable. That's the yes. key. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do want to just jump out for a second. Is there any way you might be able to like close a window or something? Like there's a, a, a pretty big glare. Yep. Hang on. Okay. Oh yeah. It just came in. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. It, 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 it made you look like you were sort of behind a waterfall or something like that. So, uh, <laughs> um, Magic. okay, perfect. So we'll, we'll have a little edit point there or whatever, but, um, so I want to jump back into, um, you know, uh, Sony specifically, uh, but also large corporations in general. Are there, you know, I, I, I think of like the movie men in black where there's like these specific issues that are happening, but they say, you know, like, this stuff is happening all the time are with large corporations like this, like what sort of constant barrages are companies like this dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis? Are there constant sort of like, I'm assuming there's not nation state attacks every single day and stuff like that. But like, is there this sort of like constant barrage of people trying to sort of like wiggle their way in or, you know, social engineer this thing or that thing? Well, it's kind of like, you know, your house, <clears throat> you get lots of mails, right? Somebody yep. stuffed some mail in. So it knocks on your door and, you know, needless to say, you know, to the level that do we know it's a nation state? Yeah, like nobody really knows. Yeah. I mean, it's all, you know, obfuscated. Um, but the reality is th there's a small set of team that is actively monitoring all of this information, like oceans of data. Yes. And trying to trying to build this lake or pond to actually make some sense out of it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, it's, it's very tough. And I feel for them because being an incident responder before managing an incident response, it's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. Now, separately, uh, unfortunately, you know, with very small team, lots of data, you know, they're expected to deliver a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And then you got this other big team of compliance and risk who are spending exorbitant amount of time to make sure that, you know, there's a regulatory governance, uh, compliance and everything else. So it's um, it, like when I said like there's a shortage of team, I, I really mean there's like shortage of like team. Okay. Um, so uh, as the security person around the time of the Sony attack, um, does all the public discourse around the gossip of celebrity and entertainment execs from leak emails affect your department? So it's not, I'm, I'm, you know, not just these sort of large scale sort of security attacks, but are you also sort of like protecting, you know, your, you know, your artists, you know, mobile phones from being hacked or, you know, company emails from being leaked and things like that. Are there, is there sort of a macro and a micro level of, of security at work or is, or are they kind of on their own? So, so you want the secret sauce about the media industry, basically. Just curious. I think our, our listeners will be interested. <laughs> so, you know, media company is kind of like a bank mm -hmm. and the, 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 the talents, as we call them, are basically deposits. Mm -hmm. So that's why you see celebrities or talents uh, tied to a studio and having their uh, production company in the studio. That's how they build relationships. So in essence, you know, the, the financier, the studio, gives them a lot of leeway because they want the talent to be making movies and you know producing movies in their lot which also they everybody makes money in one way or another um but they are very uh, i wouldn't say they're snowflakes but you know they have a different lifestyle they have different yeah. needs. they have business managers <clears throat> and they have you know so um we we treat them that they're a whole nother it's kind of like the secret sauce of coca-cola yeah <laughs> You just okay. don't go into the. You just don't go in there and say, "Hey, how you doing?" <laughs> sure, of course. Yeah, it seems like it would be like a massive scale, like BYOD issue, where you're dealing with all these sort of like external forces that are kind of coming and going from your organization. Right. So, how do you deal with that much logistics? Um. So each product production company or those talents, they have unique needs. And when I was in the studios, obviously we have a pretty deep, really good relationship with them especially if they're like, if it's, a, you know, 
one of the Marvels or DCs and yep. you really have to work closely with them. But I think with the advent of a lot of these attacks on celebrities and all these cloud and everything else, they're more conscientious. So you'll see even now, even with us, we actually kind of pivoted into providing services for high net worth or high risk individuals and mm -hmm. monitor against like threats. So there's not, there's a lot more consumption of these um, talents and uh, high net worth individuals or high risk individuals where they're now saying, okay, maybe I need to understand what's in the dark web about me. Or like, is somebody really talking about my movie or me right. or my friends? And so there is an elevated kind of awareness in protecting against those consumer levels. Now with, uh, with the, the, the sheer number of sort of contra, you know, not competing, but collaborating like production companies, do each of them have their own security strategy or does everything sort of come under the sort of the master umbrella of this is, these are the security rules that we are sort of, when you're here, you're playing by our rules kind of thing. Uh, not necessarily uh, because <clears throat> the most important thing for the, the production companies or the studios is, you know, when you're filming, that's a whole nother set. And a lot of directors now are very security conscious. So they put a lot of those measure in, like everybody leaves the phone, like nothing goes outside of the dailies. But the reality is, is that once it, once the production is done, you know, there is another set of risks that starts because now you have the director's cut. Now you have to have a master. You yep. have to have audio done. So in between those supply chain is where like a lot yep. of these things are happening. Yeah, that's so many. That's so many moving parts. Yeah. Um, so uh, you said that you sort of maybe I misheard you, but you sort of it sounds like you kind of have a reputation for being able to sort of come in after the damage has been done and sort of, you know, you said it couldn't get any worse or whatever and you can make it better. So uh, sort of in general, when massive breaches or hacks or just, you know, big problems happen at any sort of in major industry like that, what are some some lessons to be learned and that you've, you know, that you've learned or techniques to be used going forward that can help protect these things in the future or prevent them? Unfortunately, there is no techniques or lessons learned because yeah, everyone's all, a new, everyone's a new issue. Huh? Yeah. It's not, it's so I wouldn't know. So the, it's not a snowflake. Yeah. Everybody from my perspective, even personal experience, you know, we all know that, you know, well, let me kind of rephrase that. The, if we had the resources and if we had the right investment and right testing in an annual basis and, and like an annual check, I guess you could say that as a kind of a lesson learned, but the reality is, is these kind of holes and stuff like that, it's going to happen no matter what. Right. And you could prevent it by having, you know, good playbooks, having annual tests, you know, annual review of all your security controls, which is supposed to be part of your IT, you know, IT general controls or your PCI yeah. requirement. So like, where's the gap between like, you got an A from PCI council or B, you know, A from, you know, PWC saying that, oh, you know, your SOX control is great, but what, do, how do we get there? That's, doesn't make any sense. Right. So, um, oh, so, um, no, no, so no. on the other side of that coin, oh, sorry, did you have more? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> so on the other side of that coin, uh, have you seen any common but wrong actions that companies who have been hacked or compromised in any way take in the immediate aftermath of the event? I mean, I'm sure like passions are running high in the days after, but is there something that, oh, we, we've got to go to the media and you shouldn't, or we've, we, we, we got to hide it and you shouldn't like, what are some of the things that you see sort of again and again that, that people, you know, do wrong in the first steps? Well, I think, I think the, um, the public needs to also recognize that there is a there is a need for it's need for kind of um, information, but keep in mind, public needs to understand business is actually suffering on a daily basis, and they're trying to recover their business operation. So yeah. I think some level of patience is required from the public side sure. because that for, and the media forces everybody to like, okay, what happened? It's like everybody calm down. There's a lot of stuff. We can't just like say it's this or that. I mean, it's kind of like get all the facts first before you say it's something else. Right. Mm -hmm. So you just gotta, I, I don't, I, because of the media and the PR and all these social media, I think just everybody needs to like just slow down and calm down. I don't think P, unless it's like, there's, I don't, there's not a time when P, the companies are ever trying to hide it. 
They're just yeah. trying to fa find facts before they could actually publicly before announce. they make the re yeah the announcement. Absolutely. Because yeah. you know perceptions and assumptions could really have create a havoc on a lot of different things, and right. it doesn't help anybody. It's already high stress job anyways. Yeah, yeah. We we in our talk with uh, Keytron Evans, who's an incident responder, he said, "Yeah, don't panic. You've you've already been breached. You can't become more breached." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't say that because we see that. Yeah, of course, too. of course, there are always exceptions, but yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so, on the sort of career side of things, like, what advice would you give for someone who feels mired in their current cybersecurity role, who wants to jump to working in a bigger organization or a, another town? Are there certain combinations of certs or experiences or skills that you recommend to make yourself more desirable? The most important thing is don't go to these conferences and ask the question of like, how do I like how do I get into your company? Or yeah. Like, or the most, the common one I hear is like, um, you know, I have no experience and I like to understand like, which, like, how do I, you know, grow into this professional career? And I, first thing I tell them is like, okay, so what, what do you want to do in life? Right. Or like, like, what do you want to do? Is it money? Is it fame? Right. Uh, the best advice I've, oh, it's the same advice I give to everybody is just relax all these people were where you were at like two, three years ago. Yeah. Just find a good mentor and then network yourself. Don't stress over your cert, what you need to study. Like keep the course of what you're passionate about, but you know, try to network and find good mentors, you know, through LinkedIn or like go to these, listen to like your podcast. And you know, if from your listeners, if somebody says, Oh, I'll add myself to LinkedIn and you know, email Gene. I will tell him exactly the same thing. It's like, great. What are you passionate about? How can I help you? Right. But spend the time to with these new yeah. recruits because this is our new workforce for the future. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's you know, people asking you what what part of cybersecurity should I go into? Like that's that's something you got to figure out for yourself, I suppose. But once you once you say I definitely like doing this kind of thing, then it's time to find a mentor really, in that area. I kind of tell them like this. <laughs> Like I first, I figure out like what they're like interested in doing. Like, uh, like I ask them like, Hey, do you know, like about building houses? They're like, yeah, you know, my dad's a plumber. I was like, Oh great. So do you want to be an electrician? Do you want to be a plumber? Do you want to be a drywall specialist? Do you want to be a roofer or do you want to be a gardener? And he immediately gets it. So I think that's another thing that, you know, but anyways. Yeah. Um, so looking into the future, do you think that, the, what are, what do you think are the going to be the biggest cybersecurity challenges facing sort of large groups or, or any security areas with a prominent public face in the years to come? What, 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 what's, what's coming? I would say, and this is kind of my hiring model too. There are many of us kind of, I wouldn't call myself a dinosaur, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty much getting there. But I think it's the, the need for bringing in fresh ideas and fresh talents to have a different look at what we're doing today, I think is key. The technology landscape, you know, all the innovation is one set of the thing, but at the end of the day, no amount of AI and machine learning is ever going to replace human. Yeah. And we need smarter people to really think about how to defend and protect environments and companies and, or governments and so forth. But yeah. I think that's we're, the key. We're yeah, we're we're big advocates of uh, of a more diverse workforce, not just you know for the for diversity, which is important, but also because uh, someone you know uh, with with a disability is going to show you a certain thing that uh, you know a differently abled person is is not going to see, you know, and and women are going to see a thing that men aren't, and you know, uh, exactly. and so forth. So yeah, I mean, can you give me some some concrete any concrete example of of sort of surprising? things that have come out recently that you saw that, that would not have necessarily been, you know, realized with a less diverse, you know, group of people you're working with? Oh, all the time. You get yeah. the engineers and the security guys and it's about, you know, managing the product. Right. And then they're not focusing on the data anymore. They're just like, you know, look at the bells and whistles. And we hired some, you know, I, so I was very fortunate in my previous jobs where we had a good internship program. And we would bring these people in and oftentimes I'm very diverse. And mm -hmm. even, even my half of my management team was all female. Mm -hmm. And even the interns I brought in, you know, she would, <clears throat> when I had an interview with her, she was like, I have zero experience. And I was like, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, we, I'm glad you told me that. I well, like the fact that you told me the truth. <laughs> like, what do you want to do? And when we brought her in, <clears throat> she actually was better than, I don't want to say too many percent, but 
it was a good percentage. Her skills were so advanced and mm. she saw things in a different way. And I was blown away. Even the data scientists we hired from college um, for as an intern, you know, they were telling him to like, Hey, <clears throat> like do this thing, like security thing. Right. And I'm like, so I got involved because he was getting a little frustrated. And I said, listen, why don't you look at the set of the data and tell me what you think is important. You're the scientist. Right. Like, show me the ups, like, show me things that I should be like, that's interesting for you based on your mathematics or algorithm. And sure yeah. enough, he presented things. And I bet you, if he got a job at security company or a uh, trading company, he's going to make a lot of money. Oh yeah. No, that's, that's, those are amazing stories. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear them. Um, you know, we, we, we have women on the show a lot and we always ask them about how to sort of achieve, you know, gender parity in cybersecurity, which is not a <laughs> gender parity oriented industry at the moment here, but how did you, how did you specifically, were you actively recruiting for women? Were you like, how did you, how did you find them? Because there's, there's such an issue with sort of building a, a, you know, a deep bench where it's not just like getting people in on the ground floor, but having, you know, women in management positions and leadership positions and, and stuff like that. And that requires a large, you know, workforce of, of people who have been sort of kept out, you know, over the years. And so what was, what was your strategy? Well, very, believe it or not, this, this may sound really simple, but there's a lot of women in technology, yeah. like groups and yes. Forms, oh yeah. <laughs> and you know, women in, you know, women in something. Um, yep. And usually I would have HR or I would reach out to the chairperson and say, I need your help. Here's what I want to do. I think yep. it's important. Um, obviously organization aside, you know, I need fresh ideas and talents and I partner with them. It's like, why am I, why am I wasting my time going to, you know, job sites when I could go directly to like a lot of these people and a right. lot of executives in the company, they sponsor and are part of these um, organizations. So I'm always constantly saying, look, we, there's a gap uh, and we need to fix it. And I need you to help me fix it. Yeah. And they're like, Gene, are you sure you want to do that? I was like, what do I got to lose? <laughs> I literally just asked you for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so speaking of that, uh, uh, tell me a bit about your, your organization, ReSecurity. What are some specific services or benefits that you offer your client? What are you all about? Um, I'm sure it's <laughs> our marketing thing. I completely like forgot about it. No, okay. we, we are, we are, we, you know, we're all source. We provide data that's for consumers, organizations, and government agencies. And that's our customer base. Uh, we provide, you know, data. Um, a lot of people say we're the data broker, but we provide a platform where you could, you know, make sure kind of like what I said about the whole, the castle thing. Okay. So there's yeah, a castle right. and there's a people at the watchtower. It's like, but they could only see far. Our job is to provide what's beyond their scope mm. and bring what's the, what is the, what they're actually doing. And that's what's on the horizon. Exactly. So we provide the horizon data. Okay. So if people want to learn more about Gene U or ReSecurity, where can they go online? Um, LinkedIn is the best way. We also have a lot of blogs and a lot of our presses there. Um, you know, reach out anytime if it's more business related. But again, if, you know, a lot of people who are starting and just want advice, you know, you can always reach me out to me via LinkedIn. And, okay. And like our, everybody that knows me will tell you, it's like, I have an inbox zero mentality. Okay. So if you email me, I will most likely respond. It's, there's, yeah. You're, there's you're no in way it. that I wouldn't forget it. That's just me. That's great. Uh, okay. So, and it's, and it's resecurity.com, I assume? Yes, sir. Okay. Gene, you, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. This was really fascinating. Chris, anytime. I really appreciate that. And, and thank you all as well for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in Cyberwork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search Cyberwork with InfoSec in your favorite podcast catcher of choice. To see the current promotional offers available to listeners of this podcast, go to infosecinstitute.com slash podcast. Uh, and to reiterate from past episodes, uh, we have a free election security training resource to educate poll workers and volunteers on the cybersecurity threats they face during this next election season. Uh, for more information about how to download your training packet, visit infosecinstitute.org uh, forward slash IQ forward slash election hyphen security hyphen training or click the link in the description. Uh, 
Thanks once again to Gene Yu, and thank you all for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week.